I love Star Trek. I've been a Trekkie for as long as I can remember. But the thing that just puts sparkles in my eyes are the replicators. If you're not a Trekkie, replicators turn energy into matter. I think a technology like that really encompasses the feeling of the future. In the past, we would imagine the food of the future to be rehydrated pizza and chicken. <laughs> Little pills, which actually come from the 1893 Columbian Exhibition in Chicago. Now we've got things like Soylent, because it's 2020. There are computers in our pockets. Cars can drive themselves. We live in the future. The foods that we have today, are they replicated? Are they energy converted into matter? Of course they're not. And instead, we are here. The $1 cheeseburger. This is the food of the future. That is my argument for this episode. This $1 cheeseburger is the food of the future. Let's kick into it. Hey everyone, welcome to episode two of five. This is a series about thinking hard about eating. Inside of this wrapper is bun, ketchup, pickle, onion, cheese, and beef. And they come from everywhere and they are sold for only a hundred pennies and that is crazy. Wheat comes from North America. It's milled and ground and shipped to bakeries with other ingredients, you know, that are also shipped from all over and they're baked into buns. Those buns are shipped to the restaurants to wrap all of this food in. The US produces 750 billion pounds a year of onions in mostly places like Washington, Idaho, Oregon, and California. Those onions are sliced and diced and shipped all over so they can be made into cheeseburgers. Ketchup is tomatoes and onions and salt and corn syrup, and that has to be all grown, processed, and put into a bottle that can then be shipped to somewhere. There's mustard, which starts as seeds, mostly grown in North America. There's pickles, which are cucumbers, brined in salt water. The Gherkin King, that is the sole supplier of all McDonald's pickles, is in Australia. There's, of course, cheese, which comes from three different suppliers in the United States that makes 12 million pounds of processed cheese per year for Mickey D's. And then finally, beef, which in the US is from a few giant food companies. England and Ireland, they come from English and Irish cows, which is fascinating. If you think of North American McDonald's, there are over nine and a half million square miles of North America, and the food comes from California, Philadelphia, Alberta, and of course, Australia for the pickles. One dollar burgers are possible. Four quarters, one dollar for stuff from everywhere in the world, and it's only possible because we live in the future. It's not what we need, but it is what we want, and that is part of the problem. This $1 cheeseburger isn't super nutritious. It's fat, it's sugar, it's meat. But it turns out that globalism plus the industrialized food production system equals lots of demand for cheap food. And that's how the $1 cheeseburger exists. You need to move a lot of cheeseburgers to make money on a $1 cheeseburger. Patricia Smith of the University of Michigan studies the economics of fast food and she calls it the elasticity of demand. If I charge you $1 for a burger that costs me $1.10 to make, I might lose money every burger that I sell, but I'll make money on things like fries, drinks, McFlurries I would say, but the ice cream machine's always broken, doesn't matter. The economy of scale is a big deal and it's part of the reason what we eat appears magically to us. We don't have to actually create a replicator like in Star Trek, the coolest invention ever that converts energy into matter. What we do is we show up at a restaurant anywhere in the world and we can get the same $1 cheeseburger. That is the future. The future isn't pill food, just food, I guess. Chicken consumption has exploded. In 1925, chicken on a farm would go to market for slaughter after 112 days of growth. Today, 48 days. The chicken is also four times its previous mass, which is ridiculous. So that's huge. I mean, not as huge as like dinosaurs. They were really big. So depending on how far back you go, the chicken is much smaller than a dinosaur. And they actually are on the same evolutionary tree. Dinosaurs probably taste like chicken. Curiosity Stream actually has a show all about that called Tastes Like T-Rex. You should check it out. <laughs> Curiosity Stream is a streaming service that has these big budget amazing documentaries. It's really awesome. You can use my link, curiositystream.com slash trace right now during their holiday sale and you'll get the whole year of CS for 12 bucks. And if you find that you're into, you know, dinosaur stuff, but you run out of it, which is really unlikely, you can hop over to physics or global warming or space exploration, they've got it all. Plus, with my promo code, again, you're gonna get CS and you're gonna get Nebula for a year. If you haven't heard of Nebula, I've talked about it here on the show. Nebula is a streaming service that I helped start with a bunch of other thoughtful creators. And if you like my show, you're gonna like CS and you're gonna love Nebula. By joining, you could directly support creators like Polyphonic, Jordan Harrod, Renee Ritchie, me, Jade from Up and Adam. It is Awesome, and remember, we own the service. So when you join, it supports me directly and it's a win-win. $12, you get $1 a month, 
Same as a cheeseburger, amazing documentaries, factual series, and also all of our episodes over on Nebula. Promo code is trace at curiositystream.com slash trace, and thank you. In 1893, at the Columbian Exhibition, Mary Elizabeth Leese, a suffragette, wanted to free women from the drudgery of the kitchen, so she pitched synthetic pill food. And honestly, she wasn't far off. We value convenience above all. We thought we would be eating magically rehydrated pizzas, pill foods, or replicated desserts. But instead, we're here in the future, and because of the industrialized food system, our magical food of the future that removes women from having to be in the kitchen and makes food easy and simple is a $1 cheeseburger. And of course, that industrialization has consequences. They're economic, they're ethical, and they're environmental. The 99 cent meat isn't sustainable. We need to grow a huge amount of food every day, not to feed us now, but to feed where we're going to be in the future. We're borrowing from the future to feed today. Open Philanthropy Project told Vox, quote, the chicken industry has managed to cut all of their corners. They don't pay their environmental bills. They don't pay for a lot of the public health hazards they cause. They have managed to produce a product that is artificially cheap and hard to compete with. Meat is big business. Even during pandemics, meat plants stay open and became infested with COVID. When we get to the future from here, there won't be anything more to borrow. So what is the food of the future now? It doesn't have to be this way. According to a 2015 study, 90% of Americans could eat food within 100 miles of home. 80% of Americans could eat food within 50 miles of home. They could provide all of our food within 100 or 50 miles, depending on where you live. And what stops us from doing that? Capitalism, probably. Industry, definitely. But honestly, willpower, interest, the sloth of convenience. The replicator from Star Trek of the 2020s is the ability to pull food from any season to your table because of a massive logistics and globalized industrial food system. What is the replicator of 2030, of 2050, of 2100, of 2200? My thoughts, lab-grown meat, plant-based proteins, and other bioreactant and alternative proteins. And it's healthier, depending on your choices, too. Anyway, more on that next episode. Thank you so much for watching Una Dose of Trace. Turned out super well, I think, but you, you know, you should tell me. Also, let me know what you think the replicator of the future is now, or other way around. The future replicator is going to be. I'm Trace. You can find me all over social media, at Trace Dominguez, on Patreon, everywhere. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you in the future.